good morning students we continue with our lecture on children's literature theory and practice in the last class we were talking about how children's literature got relegated to a lower status how it got excluded from what is known as mainstream literature we looked into all those social conditions and a crisis which developed uh, in 1880s regarding uh, regarding the nature of novel why they wanted the new young novelist who came out uh, with a, an opinion that they need a serious conception of the novel a kind of serious novel emerged then and that actually resulted in the exclusion of children's literature earlier in 18th century novel was meant for family reading and uh, young novelist believed that uh, argued that being a genre appreciated by family readers will actually will actually degrade degrade the status of uh, novel and it will not gain that critical respectability so they thought that it is the need to take this novel outside home to be appreciated by the elite audience that is educated adult male and that that actually resulted in the exclusion of children and women and working class being excluded from reading the novel and that actually resulted in the rise of a separate genre for children because children couldn't read can't read children should be protected they believe that children should be protected from these serious novels so they need some they need something as an entertainment and that actually resulted in the rise of or the development of children's literature so these were the major points we discussed in the last class the rise of serious novel and there is a debate between henry james and r l stevenson and r l stevenson Uh, was the person who wrote Treasure Island? J Henry James had uh, uh, had he praised this in Tre Treasure Island, but he said he it lacked what is known as sense of reality. So uh, he believed that sense of reality is something uh, which should be the which should be the essence of novel. Novel should. Uh, attempt to represent life as it is so when um, when uh, he said that he is trying to bring out the point that when you reproduce life as it is it is something which children and women should not read so uh, they came out with a solution that that the children should be sent away to play with their mothers so that serious novelist can um, be free to pursue his art and write about all those facts of life so within the 20 years of the publication of this particular essay titled the future of the novel the views expressed in that became widespread the view that serious novel cannot be read by children and that exclusion as i said earlier resulted in the development of children's literature and the consequences of the segregation of this exclusion of children's literature can be seen in general aesthetic theory in literary theory in the theory and criticism of children's literature and in the literature itself so in this class we are talking about we are moving to different realms and trying to see all those consequences of the segregation so what happened in aesthetic theory so it was a common assumption that children cannot have aesthetic satisfactions 
all those aesthetic satisfactions are not possible for children. So here we have a professor, Professor F.J. Coleman, who introduces aesthetics in contemporary essays in aesthetics. And he suggests that we can rank pleasure based on the degree of intelligence and discrimination. We can rank pleasure according to the degree of intelligence and discrimination you have. And according to him, the lowest pleasure can the lowest pleasure would be those that in essential human being can feel like children, idiots, the senile, children, stupid and all those old people enjoy or could have only have all those lowest pleasure. And aesthetic pleasure can be enjoyed. That aesthetic satisfaction can be uh, aesthetic satisfaction can be enjoyed only by those who have intelligence, those who have the power of discretion, discrimination and imagination. That is essentially it points out to all those adult. So children, idiots and senile only, they can only have all those lowest pleasure. They will not be able to have that aesthetic pleasure. So he says, we do, not, we do not speak of children or the mentally deficient as experience art, experiencing art. Though of course they may hear a symphony or see a painting. They can only hear a symphony or see a painting. They can't, they will not be able to experience art. All those children and mentally deficient people, they will not be ever be able to experience art. They can only hear or see. Just hear or see. So this was the idea which developed in aesthetic theory. And coming to literary theory, there is this question. What constitutes a proper attitude on the part of the reader? So here, we have the ideas of Henry James and Stevenson. So what are the attitudes you should have as a reader? When you take the idea of James, you may remember James was the person who advocated objectification. He said that the famous character in Crime and Punishment, Raskolnikov was not objective. So he preferred what is known as detachment. While Stevenson talked about involvement, sympathy and identification. He preferred sympathy, identification and therefore involvement. And this involvement is something which is believed to be the characteristics of a child reader. A child reader gets involved. So that was the major debate between James and Stevenson. And here Wayne Booth in his work titled The Rhetoric of Fiction, he made an analysis of Jane Austen's famous work Emma and this is what he said that our emotional reaction to every event concerning Emma tends to become like her own. So here, as you see, we become, the reader gets involved. He or she become one with Emma. Our emotional reaction becomes like her own. So here Booth seems to be acknowledging that Critics do identify with character. As I said earlier, Henry James was the person who went against that. The identification of the reader or critic with the character. But here Wayne Wood says that this, this opinion about Emma clearly shows that critics too identify themselves with the character in book. But here 
then he also gives the justification that it doesn't make one an inferior reader. But that is only the half of the sentence. He says, while only immature readers ever really identify with any character, losing all sense of distance and hence all chance of an artistic experience. So here, immature reader, you can uh, change it with children. So here he says that, uh, though critics identify with the character in novels, you can't equate them with all those immature readers who, le who lose all sense of distance and they lack that, they will never get that artistic experience. So, don't misunderstand that even though critics identify with the characters, they are not like all those immature readers, that is, all those children and mentally deficient people and that also include women and working class. So this was the idea you see in literary theory. Critics and theorists who want to talk about children's literature always had this prejudice against children being immature readers who had uh, no discrimination discrimination which comes with education and experience. So always all these critics and theorists had this prejudice, this idea that children are all those immature readers. But there is this critic, Cornelia Meigs, who introduced a critical theory, critical history of children's literature. She says that children in spite of having long been treated no more than smaller and more helpless editions of their elders, they have that vigor of personality. They have that vision and enterprise of mind. So as the reading of their choice. So and something separate had its own characteristic, its own individuality and its own greatness. Though there are some critics who uh, identify children as immature readers. There are other uh, uh, critics who has written uh, history of children's literature who attribute individuality and greatness to children as well. And here there uh, comes a, a discussion like then who should criticize criticize or who should provide criticism of children's literature. Criticism, it may be noted, becomes virtually impossible in the face of this, uh, uh, this fundamental difference between adults and children's response to the same book because adults will never be able to uh, appreciate all those children's book because they have this discrimination, they have this intelligence uh, and all those children's literature is down there. It, is, it has this lower status and it is not considered to be uh, something which is valuable for this adult people or critics to write about that then who will do the criticism of children's literature? And then comes a strange suggestion that, that only children should review children's book because only they, only them can enjoy these work, these children's fiction, children's literature and they are the ones who should write about or write a review or essay about all those children's literature or children's fiction and that is as you know it is it is not something which is possible so the point is that the way adult and children respond to the same book is different so who will give that critical response to this children's work and as you see, 
the exclusion of children's literature from that class of serious literature from those all those serious novels resulted in by uh, resulted in like a classification of children's literature as a branch of popular literature as you see all those serious literature comes under the category known as mainstream literature or classical literature so so uh, this children's literature gets excluded and it becomes branch of the other part that is popular literature and this categorization of children's literature as popular fostered the belief that popularity of children's book is a proper index of its worth that children unlike adults are possessed of natural good taste in reading and later this perception originated in the vagueness with which the group of unwelcome new readers was perceived in the 80s we have already discussed that all those unwelcome new readers which included children women and working class people they believed that all those group of novelists believed that these unwelcome new readers were were offering a threat a threat to their serious novel class sex and age all those working class people sex the it is all those women and and age it refers to children they were not according to them they were not able to appreciate the best in art and literature so popularity became a critical cri criteria to judge children's literature we see that the uh, based on class sex and age they got uh, excluded from what is known as serious literature and they became uh, this children's literature particularly became branch of popular literature but there are uh, writers like kipling who showed considerable respect for writers children's author like rider haggard and he appreciate the works you know that rudyard kipling was also a famous children's author so he had this respect for another author that is rider haggard and he says that you have the incommunicable gift of catching and holding child reader so here we see that this criteria popularity is not the only criteria to judge children's literature popularity is essentially meant that it is actually connected to the sale commercial success sale of that particular work right so it is not the only criteria to judge a work a children's work he says that the works of rider haggard had that uh, grip grip to hold the readers the story to keep the child awake the grip he says that the grip is about is about everything so here we see that all those children's work had that story in it it is not as i said earlier it is not about the function of sale which determine the popularity of that work it should have as it is said a sense of story so it is thought to be something which is very important He, the writer of a children's work should have a sense of story like as you see when james henry james discussed about 
about serious novel he was talking about sense of reality while here in children's work what you need according to uh, critics of children's literature they said that it should have a sense of story so the point is popularity is not determined by commercial success alone it should provide that story that make believe world it should uh, make this uh, it should catch and hold the readers and walter allen and henry james gives out uh, the reason why um, this the reason or the uh, rise of popular novel the social conditions which gave rise to all those popular novels as we discussed earlier it is all those universal compulsory education which gave access of all these uh, novels to all and henry james particularly had in mind when walter allen and henry james he, they found that universal compulsory education was the reason behind the rise of popular novels james uh, he was particularly pointing out to all those child readers while walter allen was talking about all those working class people in franchise adult male working class people and the education given to both is considered they uh, it is considered to be the reason behind the rise of popular novels and one of the most striking features of english literature english children's literature is the amount and quality of fantasy you see that children's literature it contained that amount of fantasy and that is also the reason why we see children so literature is segregated from mainstream literature that it lacked that element of realism so the exclusion of children from the readership of the serious novel was associated as you know was associated with the acceptance of a version of realism and here fantasy is considered to be something as an opposite antithesis of realism fantasy is also an opposite of what is serious and here foster in his essay in his work aspects of the novel he gives out a distinction between fantasy and prophecy that is an important part where he discusses the these ideas fantasy and prophecy what is prophecy what is fantasy according to him he says that fantasy is something which ask us to pay something extra and he gives out an example like when we visit an exhibition when we visit an exhibition there will be something like a side show side show or a special show which are will have all those you know, special effects and in that if you have to enter for that special show you need to pay something extra he says that like a slide show in an exhibition where you pay 6 pence as well as the original entrance fee so if you if you are going for that exhibition you have to first pay the entrance fee and if you see that special show you have to pay extra to see that and he identify that there are two groups of audience two groups of audience in the first group he says that they pay with delight because they enjoy fantasy they they uh, enjoy that special show they pay extra to see that so they are the ones who according to foster they are the ones who enjoy fantasy and there is a second group who refuse with indignation they 
they uh, see that uh, special show as something which is uh, which is uh, which is a kind of very inferior one they uh, only enjoy this group will only enjoy all those classical thing so they will never give that extra money to see that special show so here there is a group which pay extra to see that uh, that side show and there is another group which uh, is who have this complete indignation for that special show so that special show is something he equates with fantasy and when he talks about prophecy he says that prophecy is much more serious affair which is uh, which demands to be taken seriously but more or less fantasy and prophecy are more or less same both in the sense that both have gods while he says that both have gods but in comparison with the gods of prophecy who are serious in nature in fantasy we have small gods all those fairies so prophecy is much more serious affair and he says prophecy being serious the other part fantasy is something which gives us delight he is of the opinion that fantasies should be saved from that close of critical apparatus we need not to judge that uh, that thing known as fantasy their appeal is especially personal it is just a side show so we need not have a criticism of children's literature that is his point which contain fantasy it should be away from that prying eyes of critics so the consequence of this prejudice that fantasy is childish is that a writer of fantasy is directed into writing for children while realistic writer has a choice and is encouraged to write for adults and uh, fantasy is equated with uh, something which is very childish so the point is that when they, we need not uh, adults need not read that and also there is no need for a critical providing a critical judgment of these works of these children literature and an inevitable consequence of the way that children's literature came into being was that there was a certain restraint being imposed on ch children's literature in realistic tradition when it comes to topics such as terror politics and sex they were not allowed to talk about all those grave things they were uh, only uh, they should only write about something which is very impressive not truthful truthful is something which we equate with novel and impressive that it contains all those fantasy so they need to write only about those things and then came then came the first and major impediment to useful criticism which lies in the acceptance by the critics of the idea that fantasy is peculiarly suitable for children and not for adults and they had all those theories all those theories in support for them we will be discussing different theories like cultural folk theory and we will be talking about the natural affinity and then we will be talking about the romantic question the cultural epoch theory states that so it is all these theories are establishing that children are are 
will not be ever be able to understand or be able to appreciate serious novel so only fantasy will appeal to them so we have this cultural epoch theory which states that individual human development recapitulates the development of the race so here the children are considered as primitives that and that is why they should be served with all those primitive literature which contain all those myths fables folk tales and fairy tales and there is this idea given by elizabeth cook she talks about natural affinity between the childhood of the race childhood of the race is the primitive age and the childhood of the individual human being so the equation is between primitive and childhood so here this natural affinity is used to explain why fantasy appeals to children and it doesn't explain this important part why fantasy is good for children and we have this romantic version romantic version uh, which believed that childs and primitive view of the world highly they rated this childs and primitive view of the world highly we have all those romantic writers like uh, wordsworth who quoted child is the father of man so there is a kind of a romanticization of this primitive age and childhood and growing up according to them is a process of losing touch with those those innocence or those essentials and we have another theory of development which which says that growing up is a progress towards maturity and there you have this uh, grip of reality so the it means essentially means in child as a child uh, you are immature and you will not have a grip of reality and there are people like mrs barbour who supported a program almost the reverse of the modern namely that children should be offered informative factual material about the actual world so there are a lot of theories regarding the development of a child and there are many inconsistencies too and this inconsistency is led to an anxiety about children reading too much fantasy so there was this anxiety confusion regarding whether we should give Uh, these children lot of books which uh, contain fantasy and with no knowledge of the actual world what will they become how can they progress towards maturity so there was also this advocacy of a balanced diet fantasy plus information about the actual world and we have writers like w j scott who are inclined to place severe limits on the reading of fantasy and the writers like lilian smith who were prepared to adopt the romantic position and we come to the end so the point is that there is this universal assumption universal assumption that fantasy appeals to children because they believe it believe it as true or at least they don't know that it is false and adult rejects it because they know it is not true see so this assumption that fantasy fantasy will uh, only appeal to children because they tend to believe that to be true why adult rejects it because they know it is not true so here the critics felicity hughes tries to say that here critics is all only trying to address this question like why children's literature is fantastic why 
He says that the important question is not that. The important question is why the fantasy has been merely abandoned to the child reader. So that is the historical question they need to address. Not these kind of questions like children's literature is fantastic. Why children's literature is fantastic? And why is it not appealing to adults? We have to uh, face the real question according to Hughes that fantasy, why fantasy had been abandoned to child reader? Why it got relegated to that lower status? Why it got excluded from that mainstream literature? And that is the state of confusion which theory of literature, theory of children's literature go through. And he ends by saying that the achievements of the writers, in particular all those children authors, in spite of uh, the lack of that critical and theoretical support. So all those critical respectability goes to serious novels. So here we see that they never got that critical or theoretical support. All those aesthetic theory, literary theory were all in support of serious novelists. According to aesthetic novel, aesthetic theory, uh, children's, uh, children will not be able to appreciate all those aesthetic, aesthetic, they will not have that aesthetic satisfaction and literary theory to support the same. And we have all those uh, theories, cultural epoch theory, all those theories where we see children being equated to being primitive. So all those things, all those works written for children was also relegated, were also considered as of uh, low quality. But here Hughes ends this essay by saying that the achievements of the writer, in particular all those fantastic, all those children's author, in spite of the lack of critical and theoretical support, they have been, uh, they, uh, they have given a great challenge. They has been, um, in spite of the lack of that critical and theoretical support, they have challenged all those critics they have come about, come out with all those great works. The amount and quality of children's literature is improving even without the support of the critics and all those support of theoreticians. So here he ends this essay. So he is trying to ask this question. In this particular essay, he is trying to ask this question why children's literature is degraded into a lower status because of the reason that it becomes that it is the branch of popular literature. While serious literature, serious novel which becomes part of mainstream literature gets all those critical respectability. So this is the point, this is the question he is trying to address in this essay. So girls, hope it is clear. Please go through this essay, underline all those major points. If you have any doubts, please contact me. Thank you girls, have a nice day.